miserable housekeeping. Please make sure your phone is on the screen and all that kind of stuff. And um, I'll just pass it on to the moderator, Mario. I roll my card applause, so... <laughs> Alright, thank you, Nina, for the very educational videos, but I couldn't help but notice that um, Alvin Presley had 1 million views, whereas Justin Bieber had 650 million. <laughs> now to our serious part. Uh, first and foremost, we would really like to thank our speakers, um, Mr. Zayn, for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, Johnson and uh, Pete are running a bit late, but they'll be here in a minute. And this event wouldn't have not been possible without Professor Pollard and Professor Gull. So why are you here in the first place? So this entrepreneurial forum actually serves as a platform to learn how to become an entrepreneur. It might seem a bit like saturated, but that's really what it is about. It really, we will we'll be talking what it takes to be an entrepreneur, how to start and Somebody once told me, do what you love and love what you do. And I think that's what entrepreneurship is all about. So I have three random facts about entrepreneurs here. The average age of an entrepreneur is 40 and not 25, as you might think. An average entrepreneur doesn't work 12 to 16 hours a day. He works 9 hours and 30 minutes. The majority was, uh, were serial entrepreneurs, meaning they started one or more businesses. Sorry, two or more businesses. 75 said this, their desire to build wealth was an important factor in starting a business. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Professor Nye, represented by Professor Gao, to give his opening speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pola. Uh, honorable speakers for the day, uh, students, and some of my colleagues at the back. Um, this kind of event is what the school is very keen to support. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Professor Mahindra Nair, who's the head of the school, and uh, he's always very enthusiastic for all student functions. I'm also very enthusiastic, but I've been more involved with the accounting and finance students, and uh, so we hope that there will be more of these uh, activities. And one of the questions I had just now as I was walking around talking to some students is, how come you haven't got students from other universities? And I think that's something you need to think about, that uh, you get the involvement, get other students from particularly the campuses, the Sunway uh, University is just across, maybe Taylor's, maybe University of Blair. Get them involved, a bit of interaction, a bit of collegiality, exchange of ideas, it'll go a long way. Anyway, uh, I've been directed by my boss to keep it short, so I'm going to keep it short. Now, I want to make three quick points and I think they sort of epitomize, they, they illustrate some of the problems that we have in our thinking. First point, um, I can't remember the first guy, 600, 600, 600 million downloads, right? And yeah, just to give up, yeah. Then there's my friend Elvis Presley, less than a million. Uh, then, the, of course, the first thing that comes to your mind is, uh, the second guy is more popular than the first guy. Have you, in academia and even in your business, we train you to think a little bit more, nudge the idea a little bit more, delve a little bit deeper into the issue. Recall that when Elvis Presley was singing Internet was not there, uh, people hardly had computers. Today, a, a kid of 10 year old carries a computer around. So that in itself can explain why, to a great extent, there are so many downloads and uh, so on and so forth. So please always put things in context, don't jump to conclusions. This is the problems we have. Second point I want to make uh, is related to why I think this particular session that you're having is important. We've had two financial crises. The current one, as far as I'm concerned, technically is a financial crisis. Uh, the stock markets have gone down by about 30 to 40 percent. 2008 was quite serious. I don't know whether we have seen the end of this financial crisis. It all depends on whether the Europeans bail out Greece. And um, in my mind, somebody who is in behavioral finance, I work in behavioral finance, uh, most of this is not driven by fundamentals, but driven by fear. But regardless of what drives the market, this is also a great 
opportunity for entrepreneurs. Whenever you, there's a Chinese saying, in a crisis, there are opportunities. Uh, so when you have a crisis, you have opportunities. And this is where smart entrepreneurs should come along and come and innovate, and ex if you like, for lack of a better word, exploit the situation, think of some uh, new uh, products or ideas, business ventures or whatever it is. So entrepreneurial activity is actually central, the crux of a capitalist system. And um, the other issue that I was, that I think I need to make is this very myopic thinking. Again, I was, I've talked to students a lot, I enjoy talking to students because I learned a lot from students actually. And I asked the student, I said, well, what are you specializing in? She said she was in marketing, nothing to do with finance or accounting. I said, hey, hey, hang on a minute. I said, marketing relies on finance to get your marketing activity going, your strategies, your marketing, advertising, and so on and so forth. And then how do you assess your strategies? You assess it in terms of financial returns. Again, finance and accounting comes in. So the point here is that they are all interrelated. And uh, the ideal situation is to look at marketing from there is a finance dimension, there's an accounting dimension, there is a psychological dimension. Some people have the view that, well, marketing, advertising exploits people. It's a psychological tool to lead people astray. So please keep this at the back of your mind when you're talking about entrepreneurial activity, marketing. Don't compartmentalize. The business world has to be seen in a broader context. The last point I want to make is uh, the issue of entrepreneurial activity. You are looking at it in the context of Malaysia. But try to push the context to a global context, meaning you look at entrepreneurial activity across borders. It's quite common now for people to be doing cross-border trading. Uh, Vietnam and Thailand have a lot of trade with China. Uh, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia. So you have cross-border trading. Now, look at that a little bit more closely because then you look at institutional differences. What are these? These are differences in laws, corruption levels, enforcement, how efficient is the judiciary. Entrepreneurial activity requires an, an institutional environment that facilitates and encourages entrepreneurial activity. Fortunately for us in Malaysia, we have uh, investor protection. We have, uh, I would say, fairly efficient legal system. Uh, I prefer the legal system in Singapore, Australia, where things are a little bit more transparent. But when you think of entrepreneurial activity, it is not just the few things that you have out here, some of the uh, activities. It's that you have to think over and beyond just the activity, but also the context. So I, I leave you with these ideas. I think they're very important points, and I'd like to think about it a little bit more. If you like to conduct a half-day session or two, three-hour session on how entrepreneurial activity involves finance, accounting, organizational behavior, law, I'd be quite happy to be involved with some venture like that, provided you get the other university students involved. So once again, congratulations, and thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. I hope you have a very successful day. Thank you. Oh, I think everybody's going to have trouble keeping up with that speech now. And I'm considering taking some finance units now. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite Pei Fan, our president of the Monash Business Club, to give her opening remarks. Good morning to our honorable guests. Monash University Summit Campus, Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Robin Pollard, Head of School of Business. Professor Mahindra Nair, represented by Professor Gal, and our respective speakers, Mr. Zain, Mr. Johnson, and Mr. Pityo. Last but not least, good morning to all of you. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Forum, and our team is the spirit of entrepreneurship. First and foremost, allow me to express my gratitude and... 
appreciations to all the support and commitments by the EF11 committee. Why Entrepreneur Forum? Well, this Entrepreneur Forum serves as an ideal platform to facilitate a fun, casual dialogues between the entrepreneurs and audience. So guys, chill out, make yourself feel comfortable, and please don't hesitate to ask any questions. I believe the speakers are well prepared to answer all of your questions. Last but not least, before I will pass this on to Mario to start the event, we, together, the EF11 committee, hope that each and every one of you today will, will leave today with a better insight about the journey of entrepreneurs. Thank you. So who are the entrepreneurs? Entrepreneur Zion is behind many organizers which have bizarre, simple and fun events. Random alphabets and his affiliate Vigo needs all kinds of, as the name suggests, random activities. In 2008, his random alphabet had his first free hugs events and successfully continued to organize a score of other flash mob projects like Carol Freeze in unison, Read While Waiting and Green Flash Mob Dance. Driving a learning curve revolving around dissatisfaction with status quo and the will to explore further, science team finds a way to unite Malaysians in very unconventional ways. Zion pioneers efforts that aim to unite Malaysians and non-Malaysians alike, setting their differences aside and just share fun moments together. Ben Alphabet also believes in bizarre acts, memorable, memorable effective attention drawers that cause spectators to ponder that randomness that this just happened in front of their eyes. Before being an entrepreneur, Sign read law as an undergraduate at the University of Technology Mara and did a postgraduate diploma in Sharia law. Direct all questions to Sign on how to break the stereotypical mold of society's perception and norms. Can I please have on stage Mr. Zain? Your plan for, for what I'm doing, 
uh, what is my plan? I say I don't have a plan. I might have a top line plan, which is I want to go to heaven. So I counter the fact that I. But the other part is that I have a plan when I have a project. I plan to the very T. But I don't have a five-year plan what I'm doing my company. I don't have a ten-year plan what I'm doing my life. I don't. That's a very big void. So now let's go into the talk. Okay. Uh, before we start, um, definition of uh, entrepreneur. This is my first time speaking about entrepreneurship. A person who organizes and operates a business taking on greater than normal financial risk. Do you agree with that? A person who takes on a business that takes a person who organizes and operates a business taking on greater than normal financial risk. Anyone have problems with the definition? Thank you. So that seems quite restrictive. Because I when I go into entrepreneurship, I at no point um, fall about financial risk. Um, okay, so what I'm going to ask is how many people in here, if you're comfortable enough to share, which when I was a student, I was not comfortable to share this information um, because I felt it made me arrogant, but how many of you here are, you have CGPA, right? So you got your first, your second upper, second lower, and third. Okay, so who here is in the second upper? At this point, or graduated at that point, second upper. No, how many of you here is at the first? Maybe you don't. Uh, yeah, be comfortable about it. It's okay. Be comfortable about it. How many of you second lower? Third. Okay. Apparently, there's a little statistic that it was it business leaders or top entrepreneurs in the world, just in general statistic, that they are made of people who graduated uni at second upper. So the people who are on first, you should start breathing the less intelligent air that we do. <laughs> because in 20 years time, you're going to be looking to your bosses, your boss, the one the second upper guy is going to say, so how's the air down there? <laughs> um, anyway, I graduated, I think, third or second upper. So I'm going to be the guy in the accounts department talking to a professor. Um, OK, I, just, I suppose I want to go back to the definition part and talk about the definition earlier, discuss risk. I don't think so. In, in many ways, that, that the work that we do does, has difficulty in either agreeing or not, not challenging that certain definitions are there. I'm not saying that you should go out there and challenge things. I'm just saying that if something is given to you, give it some thought and then see if it works for yourself or not. For example, the, the fact that it says an entrepreneur is someone who does takes on more than financial risk. Risk was not an element in my equation when I decided to do what I wanted to do. It was more motivation. Motivation, I don't know to have more friends. Motivation to know more people, I don't know. OK? So, and I just want to also talk about what the professor said, taking things in the holistic context. It's not just about, I feel, one element and then that's it. It might be an array of elements. So, so do, I put, do I do events, do I do things because I'm an entrepreneur or because I'm motivated to change the major or is it because I just like have, having people come over? Because I have people come over my house once a week and I do events every few months. Is it because I'm global about it, or is it because I like to organize things? Is that why I get my thrill? And so happens that it lands in this position. Um, but since I've been going all over the place, I just want to maybe go roll back even further to the boathouse, perhaps, and start some elements of entrepreneurship where I began. In Standard 5, I started buying, I started, when my father went to the UK, I asked him to buy a bunch of football magazines. And when he came back, I photocopied them and I sold them to my pastors. Okay? I don't know where that money went. So that was the first hint of how bad I was with money. Um, after university, sorry, after high school, no, during high school, I got into music. And then I got paid to do music. And that was a lot of fun. Again, I didn't lose anything with the money either. But a, a, a few a horrible things happened along the way, and I just stopped. And then I went to ITM. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with the university ITM, but that university is often associated with the words 
Would you prefer Mark said, sex on the ceiling? In the park, if you prefer Mark and Bates. And that. So the reason why I felt important to touch that point is because um, a classmate or colleague of yours earlier said, oh, Zin, uh, I find it surprising you're from ITM. Because usually people from ITM are not that creative. Ooh. Thinking that every year we have 100,000 students in and out, that's, that's a quite fascinating comment. But I said it was not unfair for you to profile the university as such. Because, okay, I, I don't really want to get into that. But anyway, so I did, then I went to law school. I didn't know I wanted to do law. I just want to quickly run my story here. Yeah? And please time me after 30 minutes so that we can take 15 minutes of questions. Um, I left uh, high school not knowing what I wanted to study. I did not care about my results, so therefore I didn't study that much, that much for a scale. I studied, but not that much. Um, I was only good in math and English, which, okay, so I didn't know what to study. After I submitted my, my application, I then went into, I decided to do law. By that time, the application has gone in too late. So I waited one year and joined the juniors in my high school just, to, just so I could be in law school. Once I went to law school, I thought, hmm, I might want to become a lawyer. But I started law school and I loved uh, studying in law. Throughout that time, I always had a part-time job where I taught SPM students um, at PMR and SPM maths and additional maths to earn money. During the holidays, I would get another job on top of teaching students. And if I didn't have another job, I'd be traveling. That was the pattern throughout. And the jobs that I've done since I was 15 years old throughout university and study after university ranged from things such as the first job, which was a banquet waiter at some hotel, um, retail assistant at a carpet shop. I've been a um, personal assistant, um, driving instructor, which is why I ride a bike now. Um, tuition teacher, MC, I did music, um, barista. I was in the term commits a door bitch at Zook. <laughs> um, a bunch of other stuff I can't remember myself. But anything and anything that paid, I just did it. Not because I was desperate for the money, but because my father gave me the not, and I felt that if I, that was not enough, it was, I didn't deserve to ask for more. I had to work for it if I wanted more. But I don't know where the money went. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's, I just want to drop another hint as to money management. So all throughout that time, I went. Now, and the message that I gave to my students throughout those years of teaching was that you might not know what you want to do with your life, but at least if you try all these many jobs, you know what you don't want to do. Therefore, you do other subconscious things around your life to make sure you don't end up, in my case, being a barista. In my case, not selling carpets. So that kind of helps. Okay. After law school, I wanted to travel to South America, which I later did, but I took a gap year, and that was when I started running off first. I did not start it because I wanted to start a movement. I did not start it because I wanted to be cool. I did not start it because I wanted to be cool. Not that I am. But I just started it because I felt that there was a void in society. It's subconsciously I felt there was a void. Now, let me ask you this. Maybe 15 years ago, if you ask yourself, would Malaysia have have cool bands like Incubus come to Malaysia? The answer would usually be no. People would say Incubus wouldn't come to Malaysia because Malaysia is not cool enough. That was the mindset at least. That's what I felt 15 years ago. And what I felt was that it simply boiled down to some things. When you start asking yourself why not and start digging into the reasons why not, you start discovering that a lot of things are actually possible. And this touches on to what your professor said earlier about going cross boundaries. When you ask yourself, why can't I do that? It's just a matter of getting past that mindset that you can do that. So at that time, when we started on Northwest, there was this free, uh, are we all familiar with the KL freeze? Well, not with, yeah, can I assume? Um, the video was circulating online a lot. A lot of people say, wow, this is so cool, this is so cool. And I was prompted again because people said, ah, is that happening in Asia? I got thoroughly annoyed by the remark. 
And I asked myself, why would it happen in Egypt? Everything that needs to make it happen can happen. We have everything yet. So we did it. I was hoping for 20 people to turn up, and then a thousand people turn up, just like today. That was a joke. <laughs> so, and then one thing after another, people asked us to do more and more projects, and we did it. And there was no money motivation. There was some risk motivation. I'm a risk factor, not risk in terms of money, but risk in terms of security. But it was a paranoia also. So we went on to do more and more projects. And shortly after I decided that we, that we needed money, some form of income to keep on going. So that was when we sold the t-shirts, the IRKL t-shirts that you see we sell. And then after a while, uh, advertising companies and clients, I'm starting sorry, I'm sorry to go into how we became an entrepreneur. Advertising companies have a colleague and say, hey, we want to do this guerrilla thing, this special thing, can you do it for us? We were not in the company, which is a group of people running out of my bedroom, his bedroom, his bedroom. They say, okay, we do it. And then more and more phone calls are coming in. And little did I know that when I started joining some groups, whether it's some leadership group or student group or whatever, that opinions were being met things that I was saying in, in the meeting room, so coming to the perspective that people paying attention and adults are paying attention. And then on top of the jobs to do marketing stuff, job offers are coming in. So I was at that point I came back um, South America and I was planning to go to Africa and someone said, hey, come and work for me. And I said, okay, before I take a job, then I want to travel first. And then word got out that I was looking for a job and then more offers are coming in. So that was when I got a job uh, with the bank. Um, and then I saw that, look, if I'm going to have a full-time job, I can't be going to meetings and do all these things for a while. So what I did was that I set up a company so that right now the entity is no longer Zane, but the entity is a company. And anyone who's under that entity, the company, what you know today is Wago, can go and do the meetings. So that's what happening. So while I was in the bank, um, I hired someone. Uh, me, and my, me and my business partner, we hired someone and they ran the company. Um, it did sufficiently okay, not great, not good, not bad. And after six months in the bank, just like all my previous jobs, I decided this is not for me. So I left. It was not, it was not because I felt that it didn't pay me enough, not whatever. I just felt it. To maybe address the later question that I was, I was given, not, not my passion. I just felt that the job was challenging, but not creatively challenging. And I, and I needed a creative outlet. So I left. And being, but I think what's also important at that point, just like how I chose when I studied law, was to be very clear on why I did it, and not to do it because it was happening. I don't listen to hypothetically Justin Bieber because my friends listen to Justin Bieber. I might try to give it a listen, but I'm not going to stick to it just because they are doing it. And if I'm not going, to, if, if I refuse to listen to that, it's okay, but be clear with what you're doing here. So I left the bank, and I traveled for, I think, about four months. And then I came back and I started working in a company. Now, I think the usual methods of starting a company is whereby you have a business plan, you have um, a grant or a loan. So you've got a worth amount of money in the bank, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 100,000, I don't know. And then you start a business, and you might get some clients, and as you go along, you make your losses, and then you make a profit, you build everything up. But we didn't go that route. I don't know whether we are stupid, or because we are too smart for our own good, or we are too egoistic. Um, and I touch egoistic quickly because there's a lot of entrepreneurs my age who do business and fail. And some of them are accused of getting a bank loan because they're no good run. So I, and although I'm not, I want to prove a point that, look, it can be done on your own, so we don't know. So we went on the business out of my dinner table, my own, and my own on my left, I kind of move out my father's house. And this is this is after coming in. Now, here's a slightly interesting point. In 2008, when we did the flash form, we were under surveillance by the MCMC, which is a multimedia communication and something commission, right? And people thought we were going to get arrested because this unlawful assembly, this penal code one for one states, an assembly of more than five people <coughs> under certain grounds means it's an unlawful assembly. But under those certain grounds, we did not fall under those grounds. So I was confident that what I was doing was not illegal. But still, the feeling was there. People were always asking me about it. 2008. In 2010, 
my first key client was an agency under the Prime Minister's office of Malaysia. Oh, here comes Tom. <laughs> so I felt, I suppose what I'm also trying to touch at is anything is kind of possible if you just make it to be, and if you don't go in horns up or however rules do it, you're not going to find out. And I didn't expect it to be as such. So in 2008, sorry, 2010, we started getting one client after one client after one client after one client. And today the outfit has left my previous home, my previous apartment, dinner table, we moved to another apartment where two rooms is my office, and one room is in my room, and they're going to move out in three months' time to a proper commercial uh, outfit. We have a staff of six people, an ad hoc staff of another six people, so about 12 people. And I think today there's no financial backing, there's no investors, there's no one that is going out there to give up to see, okay, hey, I'm going to give you business, not do this, nothing. Everything has been self-sufficient, um, through hard work, and I, I don't believe in my parents and God's blessing. Um, and everything is going well, and right now, today, we're struggling to find out how to hire people that can work from within us. And maybe some of those people might be you guys, I don't know. Um, so now, let's done with the story. I think that's enough for now, I'm not going to go too deep. So I want to talk about how I want to link into how I noticed the speaker today is named Johnson Lee, who is from Epic and MPTO. So there seems to be an angle when you talk about entrepreneurship today, what those entrepreneurs are. They're not just your people who started and became what today is my name. Neither are they people who are um, the cadaver chip who is in the house. There seems to be a social angle into what the three of us do. So I'm just going to touch into that 